Magsasaka, alipin ng hirap Sa tuwilang, sa pagkain ay salat Bakit laging buwis buhay Nang para sa bigas Ang lupang uhaw Paano na sa pagbungkal? Kung matuyo ang pananim, ano pang aaninin? Ngunit nang itulog ang hinain at pasakit, ikaw ay ibinawal at sa lupay Damasang tubon ng ikaw ay tubinig Balang supi ng matwit ay giniit Anong bayan ito sa kalinga ay salat Ang sisi sa'yo bakit na naaklas Kung karapatan Tunan sa ating kasaysayan Lagi na lang buhay ng maliliit Walang halaga sa gobyernong malupit Magsasaka, bayani ng bayan Sa tuwina Panahon ng maghimagsik. Katarungan! Hello mga kasama! How are you all? Welcome to today's episode on... And the online, ako po si Fidas Dagongdong, and we're here with John Dito. And today we're talking about on the Filipino peasant struggle for food security. Oh, ready na po, Tito Jo? Oh, uh, uh, magandang hapon sa iyo, ka Fidas, uh, sa lahat ng ating tagapakinig. Uh, mahalap na pagbate uh, at pakikiisa sa lahat ng ating tagapakinig. Sa iyo din po, Tito. Okay. And then let's start. How do you define food security? Food security means producing and providing enough food like grains, vegetables, meat, fish, oils, salt, sugar, and so on to the people and keep them alive and in good health. The lack, grave scarcity, or unaffordability of food, especially the staples, the staples like rice and corn, can be the cause of mass hunger, inflation, and social unrest, 
Thus, food security is a nuanced expression for guaranteeing food self-sufficiency and social stability. The expression food sovereignty is also used to stress the nuance that a nation state has the fundamental right to maintain its integrity, stability, and independence by assuring the people with enough food. Food security is best understood in terms of the threats to food production in the Philippines. The threats include the exploitation and oppression that feudal and semi-feudal relations imposed on the peasant masses and uh, uh, farm workers, including the, um, uh, the fishermen, the fisher folk. The absence of genuine land reform and national industrialization, the rising cost of production, bureaucratic corruption, military overspending, import liberalization, and dumping of foreign agricultural surpluses, expansion of real estate development, land grabbing by agri-corporations, expansion of mining, logging, and monocrop plantations, the poisoning of the streams by chemicals used in mining and agriculture, soil erosion, more frequent and more severe typhoons, floods, and drought due to climate warming, and uh, the rapid increase of population and the reserve army of labor or the unemployed. The Philippines is endowed with plenty of fertile soil, forests, and rivers, <coughs> and uh, uh, be easily self-sufficient in food. Moreover, it can produce a large amount of agricultural surplus as a major component of capital accumulation and the classic development of industrial, capitalist, uh, industrial capitalism. But the neoliberal policy makers ridicule food sovereignty and food self-sufficiency as autarky and in the name of free trade insist on subordinating Philippine agricultural policy and agriculture to the imperialist agri-corporations and banks and to the global supply chains that they control and generate in their favor and at the expense of client states. They misinterpret food security as something that they decide and from which they can extract super profits as they please. And what is your assessment of the situation of the sector considered as the country's providers of such food, such as rice, corn, and other staples, meat, um, such as pork, chicken, and beef, eggs, milk, cooking oil, salt, sugar, vegetables, spices, and many others? Please cite recent concerns if you have any. We are a country that is agrarian pre-industrial and semi-feudal, and still have a relatively high proportion of agricultural land, 124,400 um, square kilometers, in relation to the current population of 111 million. That allows food self-sufficiency for the people, as well as the export of certain agricultural products, even as the agricultural land for food self-sufficiency has been historically subjected to decrease by the expansion of land for the production of export crops like sugar, pineapple, bananas, palm, uh, and the like, and the deleterious consequences of logging, mines, and monocrop plantations in terms of spreading poisonous chemicals, soil erosion, and aggravation of typhoons, floods, and droughts due to global warming. These are continuing concerns. But in recent times, especially under the plundering Duterte regime, the peasant masses that produce the food staples are subjected to the following lack of genuine land reform, to the following, like land reform, like uh, you know, uh, these are problems, um, um, uh, high land rent and usurious interest rates, ever rising cost of production, um, seeds, irrigation fees and agrochemicals, lack of economic and technical assistance to the food producers, manipulation of prices of the food staples and other products, and import liberalization of agricultural products, which result in undue competition from uh, cheaper imports. The most scandalous development in the relationship 
of the bureaucrats and merchants at the expense of the peasant masses and farm workers has arisen during the Duterte regime. The National Food Authority lowers its buying price, narrows its role to buying only for minimal buffer stocking, and uh, allows the merchants to smuggle in the staples to bring down the price of the locally produced staples. It is now targeted for privatization after agreeing to the so-called rice tarification, which liberalizes the importation of rice. The bureaucrat merchant combine allows the merchants to buy cheap the locally produced staples at the growing expense of the peasants from one harvest season to another. Both bureaucrats and merchant syndicates rake in profits from both smuggling in the food staples, at the same time buying dirt cheap uh, from the peasant during the harvest season. The net result is the Philippines has become one of the world's top rice importers, importing more than 2 million tons of rice this year and next year. The merchants also make profits uh, with the merry-go-round of smuggling out and smuggling in of sugar. In the case of the major export crops and crops for local manufacturing of oils and spices, production is conducted by foreign and domestic agri-corporations by providing subhuman wages to seasonal farm workers who come mainly from poor peasant families. They are organized as labor gangs under labor contractors or under workers' cooperatives, so-called. Even the middle and rich peasants are inveigled to enter into growers' agreements whereby they lose their land through the manipulated prices of inputs and products. The big agri-corporations overstate their cost of production and understate the value of the exported uh, products in order to lower their tax liabilities and collect full, the full extent of uh, profits abroad. That's why, uh, according to the official statistics, agriculture contributes only 7% of uh, uh, GDP. That is a big lie. Mm. No, for sure. It's very well explained the fact on how they, how many of these corporations really do exploit the um, the peasants and the workers, uh, field workers, the farmers. Um, what would you consider as measures of food security? There are possible measures to ensure food security. They are the opposite of the policies and measures that have been adopted by one reactionary regime after another to the detriment of food sec uh, security and the peasant masses and farm workers. There must be an authority to ensure regularity of jobs and living wages, build up stocks of staples to assure the people that they have enough nutritious and healthy food and that they are secure from malnutrition, food scarcity and famine, make up for crop failures and shortfalls within calculable scales and periods of time to guarantee the continuous availability of the staples, <clears throat> satisfactory and fair incomes for the producers and stable prices of the staples to ensure the availability of feeds for the livestock and certain agricultural products as raw materials for the food, alcohol, tobacco, drug, and bioethanol uh, manufacturers. That's interesting when you put it that way. And so this leads me to my next question, which is, in the current situation in the Philippines, how would you assess the accessibility of food for the Filipino people? We still have more than enough agricultural land and a superabundance of peasants, farm workers and fisher folk. They can produce more than enough food staples and export crops, other agricultural products and fish catch inland and on the sea coast. Maritime fishing is now seriously threatened by China's violation of Philippine sovereign and maritime rights in the West Philippine Sea. I've already cited the many long-running problems that undermine and hamper food production and that can ultimately lead to much graver food scarcity and famine. There is the problem of food accessibility to the broad masses of the people because of the worsening economic crisis the rising unemployment, the falling incomes, inflation, and mass poverty. 
The economic policy of the reactionary government has been contrary to genuine land reform and to the production of a growing agricultural surplus for the improvement of the lives of the peasants and farm workers and for the national industrialization of the Philippines. The big compradors, landlords, and corrupt bureaucrats have long preyed upon the peasants and workers by manipulating the trading of agricultural products for domestic consumption. And the foreign agri-corporations and the big comprador landlords stash away their profits from export crops in foreign banks and use their accumulated capital to import manufacturers from abroad. In recent decades, biotechnology and WTO, World Trade Organization, GATT uh, provisions have become weaponized by the giant imperialist monopolies to further tighten their control of Philippine agriculture and food systems. Yet their initiatives have been allowed or even welcomed by succeeding regimes from Aquino to Duterte and their technocrats. Genetically modified crops such as the golden rice and uh, uh, BT corn have been touted for their supposed benefits. Yet many peasant groups and progressive scientists have exposed and oppose the many adverse impacts of uh, uh, genetically modified varieties on local agro-ecosystems and people's health. The Duterte years, 2016 up to the present, have been particularly terrible for the Filipino people in terms of food security because of so many major programs and policies that further prioritize tourism, real estate development, and infrastructure which are both land greedy. Instead of food production, encourage big corporate agriculture business that kill off or assimilate small farms and wreak havoc on local agriculture and related branches of food production. We only need to mention three obvious examples of this. First, Duterte's nature response to the spread of COVID-19 within the country from March 2020 Onwards was imposed first a Luzon wide, then a nationwide full lockdown, which it then prolonged and only very gradually loosened up in recent months. In the guise of stopping the spread of the virus, it immobilized the people's daily routines, including much of trade and transport. It set up checkpoints everywhere, made arbitrary requirements for freight trucks to proceed, and literally strangled the flow of farm produce to a mere trickle for many months, leaving so many truckloads of cash crops rotting in the villages, warehouses, and by the roadsides, bankrupting so many farmers and small traders, and hijacking up most uh, uh, and jacking up uh, most food prices in urban markets. Even now, more than a year later, from villages and small traders are only a beginning. Um, to recover some of their losses when they get hit again by new waves of strict lockdown measures. Meanwhile, urban markets are swamped with cheap imported vegetables and fruits from China and elsewhere. Second, Duterte's technocrats following the same path as past regimes which supported neoliberal policies from Aquino and Ramos onwards have been allowing the big foreign corporate farm and food interests to weaponize animal epidemics. In recent outbreaks of the avian flu and African swine fever, for example, the regime resorted to harsh overculling and other restrictions with only minimal support for the affected poultry and hog workers. The result is that hog and poultry prices have shut up while the country's poultry and livestock industry has become mortally weakened. Eventually, the aim is to destroy much of the peasant-based or small-scale capitalist character of the local livestock industry and replace it with huge food imports in certain product lines and by big foreign-owned corporate farms which lightly, tightly control local production through contract growing agreements in uh, other product lines. And third, the Duterte regime has signed into law the Rice Terrification Act, uh, RA 11203, in 2019, 
which is proving disastrous for many agricultural livelihoods because it encourages the importation of cheap rice from other countries and the pressing down of locally produced rice. Philippine Statistics Authority data show that Palai farm gate prices dropped from 23 pesos per kilo in September 2018 to a mere of 15 um, uh, pesos and 50 centavos in October 2019. On the ground, uh, Palai prices have further dropped to 10 uh, 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 pesos or less, and these were registered even before the farmer killing lockdowns from early 2020 onwards. At the same time, the NFA's capacity to buy at cost from local farmers has been much weakened NFA rice is now being sold at around 40 pesos per kilo from its former Philippine uh, peso, uh, uh, from uh, its former price of 27 pesos per kilo. The Duterte regime has been most abusive in widening the budgetary de deficit through bureaucratic corruption, military overspending, and overproduced overpriced and overpriced uh, infrastructure projects and has increased the local public debt. It has also widened the trade deficits by importing finished manufacturers, especially luxury and military goods, far beyond the value of the exported agricultural and mineral products. The income of the overseas Filipino workers and the growing foreign debt um, uh, have been uh, wasted by the Duterte regime. The demand for overseas Filipino workers and their income are now decreasing because of the global economic depression. Duterte and his neoliberal advisors, headed by his finance secretary, Carlos Dominguez, are utterly stupid and short-sighted. They have had the illusion that they can resort to domestic and foreign borrowing without end and without adverse consequences to the economy. When he became president in 2016, the total Philippine public debt was only uh, 5.9 trillion pesos. Now it is already 11.6 trillion and is expected to rise beyond 13 trillion in 2022. Um, this is a huge bubble that is already in the process of bursting to the detriment of uh, uh, the people, you know, 5.9 trillion pesos was accumulated since 1902, you know, and, but on, you know, in a matter of only few years, um, five to six years, Duterte has doubled uh, the public debt. So it's crazy. And uh, he has destroyed uh, uh, and bankrupted. He has bankrupted the economy. Yes, definitely. <laughs> You've definitely explained that very well on the, how he's basically ballooning all of the debts that we have and it's to the detriment of our peoples. Moving on, so could you please provide context on what is truly considered quote unquote good food? And on the other hand, what would I suppose we consider as nutritious or healthy food? What I consider good food is what I enjoy eating in the proper proportions of rice, fish, and or meat, vegetables, and fruit for dessert uh, with uh, milk uh, uh, put into the coffee uh, in the morning. <laughs> Progressive agroecology networks recommend organically or naturally grown food, locally produced and available food, and produced under conditions of fair labor practices. I also agree with the professional nutritionist in the Food and Nutrition Research Institute and National Nutrition Council of the Philippines, which have issued since 2012 the following nutritional guidelines. Number one, eat a variety of foods every day to get the nutrients needed by the body. Two, breastfeed infants exclusively from birth up to six months, then give appropriate uh, complementary foods while continuing breastfeeding for two years and beyond for optimum growth and development. Number three, eat more vegetables and fruits every day to get the essential vitamins, minerals, and fiber for regulation of body processes. 
Um, number four, consume fish, lean meat, poultry, eggs, dried beans, or nuts daily for growth and repair of body tissues. Five, consume milk, milk products, and other calcium-rich foods, such as small fish and shellfish, every day for healthy bones and teeth. Six, consume safe foods and water to prevent diarrhea and other food and waterborne diseases. Seven, use, use iodized salt to prevent iodine deficiency disorders. Eight, limit intake of salty, fried, fatty, and sugar-rich foods to prevent cardiovascular diseases. Nine, attain normal body weight through proper diet and moderate physical activity to maintain good health and help prevent obesity. 10, be physically active, make healthy food choices, manage stress and uh, avoid alcoholic be beverages and do not smoke to help prevent lifestyle related non-communicable diseases. Mm -mm. See, yes, so clearly Philippines does have the advice on how to maintain a healthy population. And a lot of these are common sense. So it's very surprising, well, it's not very surprising. It's unsurprising, in fact, that the, that the government choose to ignore this advice from the Philippine, um, the National Nutrition Council of the Philippines. Very interesting. As the Philippines has been heavily imported, uh, import sorry, and export dependent in this type of setup of food supply from our food sector it may not actually be sufficient for to provide for the whole population in the Philippines and it thus making it always at risk in the waging democratic revolution what are the urgent and long-term plans to ensure that we that the population will always have a healthy and accessible so food supply? and be distributed? Philippines is still a mainly agrarian country with the peasant masses constituting at least 60% of the population and with the agricultural land of 124,400 hectares still more than sufficient to provide food to 111 million people, raw materials for local manufacturing and export crop to earn foreign exchange. The level of technology in agricultural production is still low, especially in extensive areas where the carabaos are used as work animals and feudal relations still persist. Even in the modern plantations, there is widespread use of seasonal farm workers who bring their own land to hand tools. They are extremely low paid and uh, treated um, uh, as beast of burden. In the past 40 years, there has been a gradual expansion in the use of small-scale machinery for certain steps in palai production. For example, hand tractors like the Kuliglig and the Kubota in Yub Carabaos, power threshers and so on. Agri-chemicals have also replaced manual weeding to some extent in the major rice-producing regions. But these machines and chemicals are imported the most critical steps such as planting and harvesting are still labor intensive, even in high value cash crops, such as temperate vegetables grown on mountain slopes or in poultry and livestock farms and aqua farms. Daily farm work is still dominantly labor intensive, requiring mobile gangs of seasonal farm workers using the simplest farm implements. The majority of them, uh, in a fundamental sense, are still part of the peasantry. Even as it still has generally a low level of technology in terms of using tractors and other machines, uh, irrigation systems, fertilizers, and pesticides, Philippine agriculture is capable of producing enough staples for domestic consumption and a significant amount of surplus which has been appropriated by the landlords, big compradors, and the foreign and domestic uh, agri-corporations. You know, during the time of Marcos, Benedicto tried to sell in um, um, uh, these uh, harvester combines, 
but they realized that it was cheaper to hire the seasonal farm workers and uh, they were afraid that there would be a social explosion if uh, they would displace people, if they would displace the seasonal farm workers with the use of um, uh, the uh, um, harvester combines. The main content of the People's Democratic Revolution is agrarian revolution. This is ultimately taking away the land from the big landlords and compradors and distributing the land free to the peasants who proceed to develop their cooperatives from one stage to a higher one on the widening scales of the municipality, uh, district, and province. Without the exploitative exactions of the landlords and merchants, the peasant masses can raise a technological level of agricultural production, raise their standard of living, and produce a growing amount of surplus for capital accumulation and industrial development. The strategic objective of the new democratic revolution is to enable the completion of agrarian revolution and link this with national industrialization and basic socialization of the economy. The working class has a decisive role through the proletarian-led state in taking over the commanding heights of the national economy and in ensuring that industrial development also directly benefits agricultural cooperation through mechanization, establishment of machine tractor stations, and provision of consumer and various uh, producer goods. The cooperatives are required to deliver grain quotas to the state, but receive payments to raise the standard of living. Agricultural and industrial production are given the highest priority in centralized economic planning investment and financing that mutually benefit the workers and peasants. The Worker-Peasant Alliance is maintained and further developed from five year, uh, from one five-year economic plan to another in the socialist construction. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, so a question is, would you say that this condition that you've just described av is available in the Philippines at this current moment? And are there any examples from other countries or communities that we can adapt and sorry adopt into our country? At the moment, the revolutionary movement has been capable mainly of carrying out the minimum land reform program of rent reduction, elimination of usury, raising farm wages, improving prices of products at the farm gate, and raising production in agriculture and um, uh, sideline um, occupations through rudimentary cooperation. In certain areas, uh, for certain periods, the guerrilla fronts have carried out projects of confiscating land from the landlords and taking it back from land grabbers and promoting rudimentary agricultural cooperation among the peasants and among the red fighters assigned to agricultural production for the People's Army. Even at the stage of the strategic defensive within and adjacent to guerrilla fronts, some small and medium scale enterprises can already cooperate with the People's Democratic Government and peasant associations to produce good quality food products, which could enter the wider rural and urban markets and could supply guerrilla units as well. A few examples might be processed and packaged well. Foods and materials derived from native rice and corn varieties, a coconut, uh, for example, virgin coconut oil, muscovado, confectionaries, dried fruits and nuts, medicinal herbs and drinks, and so on. These enterprises could also be encouraged to engage as well in repair, reconditioning, and repurposing of industrial and automotive machinery already available in small towns and rural areas for the use of peasant and fisher folk associations and other producers' cooperatives in food production and food processing. Total victory in the People's Democratic Revolution is needed to complete the agrarian revolution and develop the agricultural cooperatives, as well as rural industries to advance socialism. The classic examples of agrarian revolution were those of the Soviet Union, in which agricultural collectivization 
and mechanization were achieved under the leadership of Stalin and of China, in which agricultural cooperation led to the establishment of communes and rural industries. In the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Cuba, Vietnam, and a number of East European countries, agrarian revolution and agricultural cooperation and mechanization were also carried out. Mm, I see, I see. And what can you suggest as a response to the gaps of food security within the Philippines? We need to take the following steps as a response to the gaps and vulnerabilities in food security. Number one, remove the brutal and corrupt Duterte regime from power and stop it from using public funds to import rice and other food products that we ourselves can produce and thereby raise the prices of staples and other farm products that our peasants produce. Repeal, number two, repeal the retrogressive laws enacted in recent decades that further opened the country to unrestricted food importation and weakened local agriculture and peasant livelihoods. Uh, for example, the rice uh, tarification law or RA um, 11,203. Number three, use public funds to rebuild the buffer stocks, promote local agriculture, give the decent income and economic assistance that the peasants and farm workers need, stabilize the price of their agricultural products, and make this accessible to the broad masses of the people. Number four, allow the people to get back their jobs and means of livelihood which have been taken away from them by the excessive restrictions imposed by the Duterte regime and raise the employment and incomes of the entire people so that they can buy the products of the peasants. Number five, stop the military campaigns of the reactionary armed forces which disrupt and even destroy agricultural production and the peaceful life of the peasant masses. Put to work uh, in agricultural production, the soldiers of the reactionary armed forces in their own military camps. Number six, resume the GRP and the NDRP peace negotiations and accelerate the making of the Comprehensive Agreement on Social and Economic Reform, so the CASER. Number seven, co implement the CASER provisions for agrarian reform and rural development and national industrialization and economic development. Number eight, proceed to make a comprehensive agreement on political and constitutional reforms. Number nine, end the armed conflict and realize the just and lasting peace. And number 10, implement an independent foreign a policy in order to raise resources for development and building uh, the peace. Thank you very much for that, Peter jo Um, Okay, so... Let's take a quick break for now. We're going to wait um, to see if collect the questions that people may have. And I just wanted to also quickly shout out the one some Bayern, France, which is launching tomorrow for everyone. Thank you. 
Magbabago ang lahat Tayo ang siyang kaganap Lapayin natin Kahit may kalayuan Ang maaliwalas na lahat Tatlong tundok man ang hatlan Sa ating paruroonan Kung kain natin hanggang sa mawala Tayo'y ganap na lalaya Kailan tayo patutungo sa kalayaan mula rito? Ngayon tayo patutungo sa kalayaan mula rito? Sa kalayaan mula Isang magsasaka, dalawang Panginoon. Magtanim ay di biro, maghapong na kayo ko. Di naman makaupo, di naman makatayo, pero hindi lulod. Kahit ilang dekada nang nagdarasal, may mga rehas na nakaharang, ngunit hindi ito kumpisal at hindi rin ito misa. Kahit ang lahat ay nakangat ng mga kamay, kahit ang lubinay para sa mga nasa itaas, at ang sumisigaw sa harap ay malayo sa pastor ngunit mas malapit sa langit at sa mga pangin na dekalabit dahil sa oras na ibasbas na ang tanso sa laman ay hindi ito tutubo. Bagkos, tutulo, na aniway gripong dinidiligan. Silang mga nagtatanim ngunit walang gatang sa kaldero ng Diyos ang tunay na reforma sa lupa ay isang propesiyang hindi matupad-tupad tugon. Silang mga nagtatanim ngunit walang aanihin kundi butil ng baril. Rodolfo Tagalog Senior, tubong milagros masbate, pinagbabaril ng militar habang namimitas ng nyog na kaligtas. Sunod na pinatay ang panganay niyang anak tugon. Silang mga nagtatanim ngunit walang aanihin kundi butil ng baril. Renato ang law, leader ng mga lumad sa bukid nun na lumalaban para sa tatlong daang ektarang lupaing ninunong inaagaw para gawing plantasyon. Binahil ng mga hindi pa nakikilalang lalaki habang pauwi kapiling ng kanyang asawa't anak tugon. Silang mga nagtatanim ngunit walang aanihin kundi butil ng baril. Ramon at Leonila Pesadilla, mag-asawang aktibong miyembro ng asosasyon ng mga magsasaka sa lambak ng Opostela. Tumitindig para sa kalikasan laban sa mga higanting minahan. Binahil sa loob mismo ng kanilang tahanan sa harap ng kanilang limang taong gulang na apo tugon. Silang nagtatanim ngunit walang aanihin kundi butil ng baril. Juancho Sanchez, tumigil sa kolehiyo at namasada para makatulong sa natrikula ng mga kapatid. Dalawampung taong gulang ng minasakir kasama ng anim na iba pang pesanteng martir sa Asyenda Luisita Tarlac taong 2010 na bawal ang salang lahat ng militar at pulis na sangkot sa pagpatay tugon. Silang mga nagtatanim ngunit walang aanihin kundi butil ng baril. Victor Lumandang, Enrico Paprika, Rotelo de Elto, patay, matapos sagutin ng bala ng pulis, kidapawa ng panawagan rasyon ng bigas para sa libu-libong magsasakang isang taon nang walang makain ng dahil sa El Nino patawarin. Kung hindi nabanggit ang lahat ng alang binaon sa ngala ng karit, hindi ba't nakakapagtaka kung bakit ang mga pilapil ay tila naguhugis krusta? Sinabi lang hindi ito misa. Pero magpapatuloy ang pag-angat ng mga kamay hanggat ang mga katawang tila palay sa bagyo na bumulag tayo, wala pa rin ibinhin ang sagot ang sermon ng mga palay ang binaligtad kasama ng mga kubong na atindig na buwis na galing sa kanilang pawis ngunit sa batok ng burgis na tuyo ng balad, ng sakhad 
ng butas na sa maghapong panggagapas para sa pasahon na hindi malalaglag sa loob ng iyong kamao ng bawat pitak na naging pata dahil ang basi sa utak ng mga walang masaing na inin na kasyudad na tanim ang nakapakong pa rin ng irigasyong sa tubig din sinulat kasing haba ng inutang na dugo ang listahan upang lumaban kalabaw lang ang tumatanda dahil tao ang pinapatay tugon! Kung tatlong beses kayong nakakakain ng ostya sa isang araw, lalabas pa kayo ng simbahan na tatawagin pa rin itong katamaran. Walang tugon, isang mabuting balita mula sa sinong Panginoon, isang nasa langit at isang Panginoong may lupa na noon, o may sinasamba ng gobyernong deboto ng pon, ng mga sinderong ting sa sirit ng dugo ng mga magsakay ampon, isang magsaka, dalawang dasal, isang ama namin at ang paulit-ulit na panalangin para magkaalmusal. Sa lupang guhit nila sa palad ang kinagis ng ina, ama, kapatid, anak, kapag ang magsasaka umiyak, hindi ito dahil sa pag-ibig, hindi dahil sa lupang nagpapakain sa ating bibig. Paalis na ako, naunahan pa yung araw Almusal ko yung baho Agawan ng jeep at trabaho At traffic pa sa may kalaw Halos hindi na ako umuwi Puro na lang ako talaw Sa tahanang maliit Kada buwan, limang libo Inuuwi ko, sakit balikat Likod at ulo, malaki na raw Ba't pa ako nagre-reklamo Talagang tikis trabaho Talagang linis ang baho Ng boss na Amerikano Kontraktual, artiladong katawan Binigay lahat mula balat hanggang laman Hanap naman ng bago pagtapos ng ilang buwan Ginagawa lahat, magkalaman lang ang dyan Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Magtrabaho nga ba o magpaapi? Hanggang labihan ka kami Mabuhay ang maayos hanggang sa mga karaos Wala ang maga hanggang gabi Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Kasi hindi nakatapos At kayo't kalabaw Nakakapamintig ng pagod Nalulunod pero sumusuong pa rin sa agos Parang kailangang sumigaw Para lang di mapaos Matay ko Tulad na nanghihina sa pinagdaanan Ako'y minalas ako kung may kasalanan Kasalanan 
pagkalaban sa mga nagmamayari at ari-arian Tinatulan kahit delikado na gawain, itutunan pa rin para lang meron maihain Kano nga ba ang salapi? Magtrabaho nga ba o magpaapi? Dapat itama ang mga mali Buhay ko ba'y katumbas ng salapi? Salapi, 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 salapi Hello, welcome back everyone. So we have a few questions for you, Tito Job. Are you ready na po? Sige. Uh, okay. On the questions from the audience. <laughs> so the first question is, there is a movement in the Western countries to switch to animal-free diets, such as... I have no objection to veganism. My son is a, a strict vegetarian, no? And neither... Oh, what? oh okay. She's still asking the question. Uh, please, well, please complete your question. <laughs> It's <laughs> okay. What can you say about this? Can an individual effort of people to switch to plant-based diets really have an effect to food security or the end of animal exploitation? I have no objection to veganism. Uh, in fact, uh, I admire my son for being a vegan. And uh, uh, there are also ways of producing what you call veggie meat. Uh, after all, protein comes from the vegetables, no? Um, but neither do I have any objection to those who uh, eat meat uh, in the proper uh, amount, no? Because I know the, his, the um, prehistory and history of um, uh, eating meat, no? Uh, when, the, when the people started to eat meat, uh, and uh, especially after uh, uh, cooking them, huh? Uh, they became bigger, huh? <laughs> their the mm-hmm. breed became bigger. And so uh, uh, you will observe that those who eat more meat uh, in relatively more um, uh, quantity uh, tend to be taller and uh, um, uh, bigger uh, than those who would be restricted to a vegetarian diet. You can you can compare the Dutch and the Yugoslavs to, uh, let's say, the Indians and um, <laughs> and uh, you know those who uh, have uh, a heavy um, uh, menu of uh, of veganism uh, in their uh, eating habits. So. No, absolutely correct. I mean, me personally, I am on a flexitarian, which is primarily vegetarian diet and you're you're not wrong it is much better for people but again as long as you don't eat meat in excess right <laughs> maybe i should continue uh, because yeah. i haven't covered the the, the 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 aspect of food security in the question of course yes please uh, go so, go go ahead you know poor people in the market uh, meat is priced higher than vegetables yes it's more expensive so uh, it, uh, it's possible for people 
um, as a measure of uh, economy uh, to develop uh, a vegan menu. Um, but then the, we should not give up on uh, providing uh, uh, the proper amount of meat to the entire population. As a matter of fact, certain countries uh, um, uh, get agricultural surplus uh, in order to raise, uh, um, in order to accumulate capital. Because your agricultural uh, surplus translates uh, to um, mm -hmm. um, to uh, cap capital accumulation. Um, for instance, there are countries that uh, um, stress um, uh, livestock production for the purpose of selling the meat, no? butchering the, the animals and selling the meat. No? There are also countries mm -hmm. that uh, um, puts the stress on producing milk, like the Netherlands. No? And you can see the famous picture of the uh, Dutch uh, lady uh, uh, in in the in the Dutch farm uh, milking the cow. No, so uh, yeah. uh, we should not give up on the on the meat production. We don't have to eat the meat. We can produce the meat for the benefit of the people who continue to uh, uh, to use uh, meat. So. Um, I think uh, to think of uh, food security as a whole, we must be able to provide uh, a whole range of uh, uh, farm products. Uh, that you have the food stables, the grains, you know, uh, be it wheat, uh, rice or good grain, um, the, um, the, um, the vegetables, the fruits, uh, the meat, uh, yes. and so on, and the fish, uh, the fish cuts, and so on and so forth. So you know, you, I think to be comprehensive about uh, ensuring food security, we have to make all those available. And then, you know, in certain countries, there are those people, communities that prefer to eat uh, uh, corn rather than rice, mm -hmm. for instance, or a mixture of the two. You know? So mm -hmm. you have to, uh, um, you, you, uh, you have to into account the variety of food that's needed by the people. Yes, no, definitely agree on that. Um, I suppose a lead up question to what you just answered. Um, could you please elaborate on the concept of planned economy regarding food distribution and how this can lead to self-sufficiency? Uh, let, let me give you the most comprehensive uh, um, uh, graph of the Chinese economy when it used to operate according to and the principle of socialism, no? Agriculture is considered the basis of the economy. So that's how important it is, especially when you are growing out from the underdevelopment of the past eh? and uh, you are still building your industries. And, uh, and then, but you, there must be a bridge between agriculture and heavy uh, and basic industries because if you just concentrate on um, on uh, the heavy and basic industries as the leading factor, then um, you, the tendency will be, you know, to make the, the economic, uh, the plan lopsided. Uh, so that was a mistake uh, in the previous uh, socialist construction under Stalin. But of course, uh, mm. uh, th that was a mistake that could be corrected. No? And um, so um, you have to have a middle term and a, uh, uh, in light industry, a bridge. The light industry must be a bridge between agriculture and um, industry as the leading factor. Uh, light industry means providing those handy producer goods you know, and materials necessary for production like uh, fertilizer and so on. And um, also it provides you know, the consumer goods. Yeah? Um, you you uh, you provide uh, instead of the people and the countryside rely, relying on the old method of weaving, uh, you make use of the uh, the modern textile industry to provide more clothes, you know, and a more variety of clothes. So um, yeah, and uh, the light industry uh, by using a light industry, you accumulate even capital faster. Mm -hmm. You um, because the peasants uh, buy those. And uh, those things produce, serve the needs of the peasants. 
So uh, in this uh, picture, you will see how important agriculture is. Because, you know, if you, if you don't assure the people of food, they will rebel and they will rise up. <laughs> yes, definitely. If you, if you extract too much from the peasants, you don't give anything in return, like machines and products of light industry, they will also rebel, uh, rebel because you're getting so much from them uh, without, uh, without uh, uh, a good exchange. No? So there is yeah, yeah. a balance of the three uh, and uh, the five-year plans are made according to that, uh, um, even uh, uh, to that, uh, uh, what you call that, um, um, even and uh, uh, well-arranged plan. No? Mm -mm. Well, thank you for that. Um, our next question, okay, this is a good one. So food banks, for example, here in the UK, they're a very big thing. Um, they're made oops, they're made to address the overproduction of food by the capitalists and say that this could be um, this gives access to families in order to have the you know secure food security. Do you think this is effective? And also, could you maybe explain what could go wrong with food banks? Uh, you know, you learn from the Bible. Eh? Um, <laughs> that the uh, Egyptian authorities should be advised, no? Uh, that yes. um, when they have agricultural surpluses, they should stock up because there is a possibility of drought and uh, floods uh, and mm -hmm. uh, a, mm -hmm. uh, a fall in production. So, you know, you anticipate the uh, problems that you don't see immediately. And, but mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. base yourself on, on experience. Uh, uh, experience with the uh, climate of a certain country. So um, that that is the general premise. Now, um, yeah. I think for the Philippines, for instance, we need to have a buffer stocks, especially in the staples, um, so that um, uh, the people will not go hungry. They will not be victimized by inflation. Uh, they, they will not rebel. Yeah? There is social stability. Um, and, um, uh, and so there are so many reasons. Uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. these uh, food banks of the capitalists uh, uh, are uh, adjuncts of a, an imperialist system, a system of taking advantage of the of farm workers in the imperialist country, as well as the peasants and farm workers in the uh, client states. No? That's what's wrong. Yeah. And of course, uh, it's the, it's relatively the best they can do to serve hungry people. No, um, but that's it's one way of uh, stabilizing the situation and keeping the exploitative system going on. No, so, yes. Uh, it, this is so much, uh, you know, making buffer stocks here is only for alleviating. Uh, problems that might arise, or let us say, um, uh, uh, showing uh, to the hungry people that the state, uh, the capitalist state, and the monopoly bourgeoisie are nice guys, no? uh, that they will <laughs> issue to you the food stamps. No? But then they will uh, use their ideologues and publicists to mock you uh, as uh, parasites. No? <laughs> and uh, and to stress the point that uh, the capitalists are generous guys, Santa Clauses, uh, and uh, uh, people <laughs> who lose their jobs or are out of jobs are abusive people. No, so that's how they, that's the picture. That's uh, uh, by the way, that kind of picture is stressed uh, under neoliberalism. Uh, uh, we yes. just push down, uh, and yet when people don't earn enough, they're accused of being parasites. And uh, mm. uh, when they, they are in need, no? they don't get enough pay or they lose their jobs. So uh, they're in need, and so, uh, but then they're marked as uh, uh, mere parasites. No? Uh, they, that, uh, they cover up uh, the uh, iniquitous uh, uh, economic and social system. No, no, I'm, co I'm in complete agreement. <sighs> I usually always say that food banks aren't there <laughs> because people are being leeches. No, the food banks exist because capitalism exists. They, they don't have a choice. We're made to, well, when people are hungry because of capitalism, you have no choice but to beg for food, right? So again, just 
toxic cycle po. <laughs> the best system is um, you, you get what you deserve by virtue of your work, no? Uh, not, you know, yes. uh, because of the, 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 the uh, generosity of some exploitative guy. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It's all just, it's all a means to maintain a manipulation, is it not? To yeah. keep the people in the system. So, anyhow, the next question would be, um, peasant classes in the Philippines are considered as the poorest class in society. Though they are the ones providing food, as in the Mang Sasaka and um, or the... Um, and if I was the peasants that are working, um, what do you think is the reason for this and what could be a possible solution? Yeah, the peasants are the most uh, exploited and they're the most deprived of land, in fact, no? Uh, and yeah. uh, food, no? It works this way. Let us say uh, you go to the frontier land, open up the land, no? Um, mm -hmm. Because of your, your low level of understanding, uh, you're deprived of education, you think there is always plenty of land that you can uh, open up and sell cheaply. Or some yes. wise guy would uh, uh, put together a gang of uh, landless peasants and they open up land uh, somewhere. And then uh, the wise guy who give uh, the rations would be become the landowner. And the peasants yeah. who work on the on the land would become peasants, no? So yes. you see, the poverty uh, is taken advantage of. Also, in case of uh, uh, their production, no, uh, harvest time, uh, harvest time, the uh, peasants uh, are approached by the merchants, the merchant usurers especially. They will be approached, um, uh, and the merchants will take advantage of the fact that they, there is a relative. Uh, uh, relatively big amount of uh, um, of uh, rice, let's say rice, in the market. Okay? Yes, they use the they use the harvest season as uh, uh, which seem to provide a bounty eh, of uh, rice. They use it in order to price low eh, the rice. So early on, the peasants would. Uh, uh, would sell if they have, they can dispose of their share, if they were tenants, if they could dis, uh, uh, sell their share of, uh, of uh, the production, or if they were small uh, owner cultivators, um, they would like to, um, if they, uh, they would like to, have to have, they like to have ready cash, no? Um, yes. They're in, in need, no? They spend so much on the, uh, production and they would like to recoup immediately, but their need is taken advantage of. Then mm -hmm. when um, the rice uh, um, um, becomes less than during the harvest season, the same peasants would be approached. If, if they still have some rice left uh, in their uh, household stock, they, the merchants know mm -hmm. that they're desperate, okay? And then they can price low. Uh, exactly when the peasants are, uh, you know, uh, practically uh, 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 throwing away uh, what uh, what is a better life than uh, usual, uh, or when they already the, the, the desperation comes, or just during that time, past uh, long past the the harvest season, that's the time when the, uh, the merchants come to further lower the price and. Yes. Uh, by dirt cheap, eh, the the rice. That's how the peasants are taken advantage of. But of course, if you are a tenant, man, there are still many people who are tenants. They're completely under the uh, uh, dictates of the landlord. And you know, in the accounting of um, of uh, production cost, uh, um, that's usually uh, you know manipulated by the by the yeah. uh, landowner and by the overseers. So. And um, actually, the biggest number of unemployed comes from the peasantry. That's which you call the reserve army of labor. Those out of jobs, they come from the uh, uh, from the uh, peasantry. So you, they appear as the footloose, eh? very pathetic uh, uh, farm workers or uh, mining workers. They go to the mining areas or they go to other areas to work as farm workers or they take occupations 
odd jobs in the urban areas. Most of these yes. people, uh, of course, the uh, the uh, urban poor also generates its own uh, uh, reserve army of labor. No, but there, mm-hmm. there is no the bigger, the biggest uh, um, bulk of uh, unemployed people come from the peasantry. And you know, there there, there is there stupid uh, social scientists, you know, the university pedants and and uh, bureaucrats who say, oh, the young people now are um, um, are abandoning the countryside. Stupid. Uh, there is no industrialization to absorb. Huh? The the unemployed. So uh, what the, these uh, unemployed people do is to take odd jobs uh, in different yeah. parts of the country. It's not because just because, and then they uh, they they understate uh, the the number of peasants by listing up only the uh, um, only the head of the family. You know, a, fa- a a peasant family, every one of them contributes to the uh, to the production. Uh, even uh, children, nine years old and above, no? Uh, and then when a member of the family takes odd jobs elsewhere, he contributes to the common common fund, no? Uh, but some people say, oh, this is now a worry. Well, we, are, we are producing only 7%, no? Uh, uh, agri- as agricultural out- output as part of the, of the GDP. The young people are abandoning. What abandoning? Uh, <laughs> So uh, <laughs> they are looking for jobs elsewhere, and the luckier ones with the ability to speak English. Eh? Now those who belong to the uh, probably the rural petty bourgeoisie, no, uh, from the middle, they they've been able to obtain um, high school education and the ability to speak English. They go abroad, no, they become the overseas contract workers. Uh, because right in the Philippines, there is no industrial development. So uh, you get the point how uh, we are pushed down in the Philippines by the imperialists and by the local exploiting classes. No, no definitely very well explained, uh, Tito Jo. It's, again, it's just all a maintenance of system, is it not? They, especially with the narrative that they're saying that people are abandoning, when well, no, it's just desperation leads to such desperate measures. Um, but yeah, just horrendous. Um, uh, that's, next. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, please. please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, so next, the, the news these days have told us that farmers are throwing away their produce and, and the fact that it has happened years before and it will surely happen in the future. Why are they throwing their crops away? How can they compensate their capital if they throw away their crops instead of selling it? Isn't there an available program or support from the government? That's another myth from the uh, uh, bureaucrat capitalists, the government, the, the rotten government officials and the uh, academics you know, who don't know any better. They, this kind of myth is similar to, you know, uh, the notion that young people are abandoning um, um, rural life and uh, rural production. That's not true. Uh, you don't just throw away the products of your uh, uh, labor and uh, what you spend on. Um, you throw away when the thing is already rotten. No, uh, you you would throw away huh? anything that is rotten. What do you do? You uh, stock up on uh, things that uh, uh, have not been um, bought at the proper price, or um, uh, things that you produce but which the merchants do uh, uh, do not have any interest in because they cannot they cannot uh, acquire those things at the price that they dictate. So <laughs> this is another bit. No? Uh, you know, then that's how uh, peasants are victimized. They're not only victimized by actual oppression by the military forces that uh, undertake operations, uh, military operations again. They are victimized by the exploiting classes uh, through the daily violence of exploitation. And then you have the intelligentsia uh, under the orders uh, in the pay of the uh, exploiting classes who invent these notions. Uh, to, to put down the peasants, no? Uh, that the peasants are so rich, uh, after all, that they can throw away their products just like that. <laughs> you don't throw away anything if this has not become rotten, especially food, no? Food has a life, uh, has a lifespan. Uh, if, uh, if, if, uh, uh, you cannot just stack it up, no? Indefinitely. 
Okay. No. No, definitely not. Especially not with fresh produce. And I think you'd have to be a certain type of person to blindly believe such very false and very, as you would say, very stupid rumours. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if people know farmers. They're probably... <laughs> the type of people that would never waste any bit of an animal or vegetable that they have, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just... <laughs> you know, on the face of the story, uh, poor people yeah. throwing away uh, the product of their labor is as silly even as when you say a rich guy throws away things just for fun. No? <laughs> Yeah. Even even the exploiters do not throw away things uh, unless there is so much a surplus, and then they manipulate uh, scarcity. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah you know, exactly. It's a, it's a capitalist trick, but peasants are not like a capitalist tool. Try to solve the problem of overproduction by, uh, you know, uh, limiting production or uh, um, uh, warehousing the products until better uh, better market conditions come, no? Yeah. Then they don't have such uh, luxury eh? and uh, privilege exactly. like the exploiting classes. Exactly. Well put, Petita Jo. And so the next question, um, could you explain maybe how the pandemic has affected the farmers and how how are they currently surviving, I suppose? I think very much uh, the farmers are suffering greatly because of the pandemic. Uh, in my presentation, there was a, a, an emphasis on, you know, the, uh, the, uh, their products not being moved properly. Uh, so the products are uh, rotting uh, at the parking lots of, uh, you know, these delivery trucks or these, these trucks used by the merchants. But in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the peasants, um, if the peasants don't get immediately an income from what they produce and they are restricted uh, to their places, uh, to their own uh, homes in the in the barrio, they cannot even uh, take odd jobs. You, know? you see, uh, odd jobbers in Manila were sent away, were sent back. So, um, and, um, and that increases the number of people to feed in the countryside. You know? When uh, people go back to uh, to uh, the rural areas because they, they think uh, food is there is available there. So um, and the, the farmers, the, even the production of the uh, the farmers would be affected if they don't get any relative amount of surplus uh, to pay for certain costs of production. Their production is uh, is adversely affected, and I suppose. Uh, uh, the output of agriculture, output of staples, mm -hmm. uh, uh, have been severely affected, no? And so there is a um, um, chain reaction, no? Um, yeah. Within a household, you don't produce enough, and you cannot sell enough, and then you cannot, uh, members of the family that, that have odd jobs elsewhere, cannot even earn enough to contribute to the uh, family pot, no? And, no. you know, this, you know, this uh, academics and uh, and exploiting classes do not consider. They don't know uh, the the life of peasant families. <laughs> no, they definitely not. They it's just I I like to say it's like projection. They're projecting their own insecurities of their own life and enforcing it on people that don't even live in the same standards as they do. You know. <laughs> Okay, so this is the final question that we've been given. Going back to diet real quickly, is there a way for people to learn from our um, indigenous roots in terms of diet and consumption of meat and other uh, sources of food, such as how fish was the primary meat, quote unquote, um, and land meat, uh, such as pork and beef and chicken were primarily eaten on rare and festive occasions, etc. There are many things we can learn from the traditions of the people uh, with regard to the production of food and uh, with regard to eating habits. And uh, there are, uh, we cannot just uh, uh, ignore those. We, have, we can adapt uh, uh, or, and uh, um, uh, develop uh, what we can learn uh, from our traditions. And uh, in fact, you know, 
there are uh, uh, to to take a very good example people uh, know how to use plants uh, in order not only to feed themselves but to cure certain diseases so you know the the, the big pharma goes to india and tries to take free and then they 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 get the patent rights over you know uh, you know yeah. uh, the uh, med- medicines that can be drawn from the local plants you know so that uh, that's traditional wisdom being appro- misappropriated by uh, the imperialist uh, 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 pharmaceutical firms so there is plenty uh, to learn um, for instance uh, I, I would have the, as an Ilocano, I would have the uh, stereotype of the igoro uh, just eating sweet potato. No, yeah. but in in, um, in uh, uh, when I lived with the igorots, uh, they eat uh, uh, a good amount of rice combined with uh, uh, you know the ordinary rice and the glutinous rice. That's where I tasted yeah. uh, that combination. All the Cebuanos are known just to take corn. No? Oh, they combine corn and uh, and rice, huh? especially. Yeah. There are many things to learn. Um, and uh, the important thing is, you know, what are the, uh, the healthy and nutritious foods that should be made available. And uh, we can learn from, for instance, uh, um, be, even before there was the miracle rice, um, uh, developed by the Rockefeller Foundation supported uh, IR, uh, 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 IRRI in uh, Los Banos. The BPI, our uh, local experts had already developed uh, uh, strains of rice uh, that could be grown with less uh, with less irrigation, with, with uh, less water and without the use of so much uh, uh, agrochemicals. But you know, uh, the uh, miracle rice raised the cost of production by uh, um, obliging the peasants uh, to rely on a steady supply of uh, of water from the irrigation system. So the, the government was forced to get loans uh, from, the, from the World Bank. And then uh, yes. the... Um, uh, this variety uh, would um, uh, require the peasants to uh, use a lot of uh, pesticides and uh, uh, other and um, fertilizers. So that, that, that's the kind. But the, the one, the, the variety or the strain made by our local experts um, was not as costly. As that, but then uh, Marcos was uh, cooperating with the imperialists. So uh, again, there is now this so-called golden rice. You know, this golden rice um, can infect uh, not only local rice varieties, the varieties that we have had before, but also other plants. Uh, it is contain- mm. it's contaminating, no? And then. Uh, yeah. Uh, it requires uh, 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 higher cost of production. So, and now this Duterte regime, after some, how many years, so many years of our experts uh, studying this, holding it in abeyance, Duterte, the idiot uh, Duterte, suddenly uh, allows golden rice uh, <laughs> to be uh, to be adopted. No? So, uh, that can have a... Um, very uh, wide and deep going consequences uh, to Philippine agriculture. Uh, it's the same uh, imperialist companies like Mons- Rockefeller Foundation, Monsanto, mm-hmm. Singenta, and you know, this uh, uh, big uh, um, uh, of food monopolies of, uh, of imperialism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, no, thank you for explaining that. Um, So we have a couple more. Advertisements on agriculture um, often say that there is enough food for the entire world, and yet the number of starving people is ever increasing. Why is that? If there is enough food for everyone, why are more and more people suffering in starvation and hunger? A food poverty, basically. Why is it increasing? On the other hand, some people organizations are saying that of your population is the cause of starvation and 
food insecurity. Could you please tell them why this is not the case? <laughs> you know, the experts of the imperialist uh, or those who are in the UN uh, who are experts uh, at, uh, um, at the FAO uh, uh, make uh, certain uh, generalizations based on their researches. Um, the yeah. general notion, uh, the general conclusion that is uh, widespread is that um, the resources of the earth uh, are more than enough to provide food for twice the existing population no? of uh, mm -hmm. seven to eight uh, billion people. I tend to agree with that, no? but the, uh, the point of disagreement would be uh, these experts uh, in the UN and uh, uh, are experts of the uh, uh, monopoly firms in the food business. So, you know, mm -hmm. they, they put forward that uh, you rely more uh, on what the um, big, what the monopolies can do, not what the mm -hmm. people, the poor people, people can do. They advocate, you know, continuing the situation, exploitative situation, in which mm -hmm. the foreign monopolies can freely take advantage of the resources and people in the underdeveloped countries. So the, the point of the disagreement is that I advocate that the people themselves. Uh, in the clients, mm -hmm. rise up to um, to, to uh, do away with this uh, foreign control and uh, uh, exploitation of the human and uh, natural resources available. So uh, you know, sometimes you know, um, revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries can uh, agree on one thing. Eh? Uh, mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. a, on a thing, huh? a factual thing. They can see there's an airplane huh? or a, a limousine. Yeah. Huh? Both, both, uh, both poor and rich people would know that there's a limousine. But the big difference is that poor people cannot use the limousine no? <laughs> unless they're the driver. Because, you know, experts sometimes, you know, uh, have to show some amount of uh, truthfulness, even if only to acknowledge certain facts that cannot be denied. No? So that's how bourgeois science works. No? <laughs> mm -hmm. no, completely correct. That was a very good analogy. And in, in stating that people can, people will use facts and then twist it in order to manipulate to fit their own narratives. And that's essentially, as you said, the bourgeoisie scientists and capitalist scientists and <laughs> used to maintain the system, very much correct. And thank you for that explanation. Because I, I really do struggle with people when they tell me, uh, when they ask me that question, sorry to go on a bit of a tangent, but yeah, I, <laughs> people always do ask that and always say, oh, why, why are people dying then and from hunger? And I always say, well, if there are foreign nations controlling food supply and distribution, I, I don't know what are you expecting. You're not ex I'm not expecting them to give it to the people that need it the most. They're going to give it to their own people. Uh, let me uh, uh, make a very concrete example. No? Yes. Uh, if you have a unit of the new people's army going around to do revolutionary mass work, um, they will calculate that they cannot, if it's a platoon, no? if it is a squad or platoon, they cannot stay too long yeah? in a mm -hmm, village. Mm -hmm. Either yeah. or, they will eat a lot of the resource of the community. And uh, so that their presence would not be resented, uh, they stay for a short period. And it's good for the people's army to be very mobile. No? And so, um, and then uh, the um, the NPA squad, let's say it's a squad, no? it mm -hmm. will have to uh, help in the rural production. They can help at least the families, giving them the food, no? Uh, okay. But uh, uh, the, uh, the revolutionary, the NPA can do much more than that, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, they, they will uh, inform the party, well, this area has so many villages that would require the expertise of our uh, agricultural experts. Okay, so uh, the, the experts will sh show how um, production can be raised. No? 
And then yeah. another thing that the, the NPA unit can do is to, um, uh, or, or the uh, command of the NPA as well as the party leadership will see to it that uh, families of, uh, of um, um, red fighters are w w well taken care of, that they must be assisted in production, and, um, and then the NPA itself can uh, create um, mm -hmm. and create uh, production units, you know, so that mm -hmm. uh, in the long run, uh, they, uh, they get more than, they produce more than what they use. So, and uh, they can also, uh, with the uh, plots of the uh, agricultural plots of the NPA, it can be demonstrated how cooperation uh, can be used eh, to produce yes. better results in farming. Uh, so there are many ways uh, that uh, uh, the revolutionary forces can help. Eh? But the biggest thing that uh, the revolutionary forces and the NPA, the party mm -hmm. and the NPA, and the peasant associations can do is to surround the landlord class, uh, disempower it, no? make it mm -hmm. isolated, and um, make it ineffective in exploiting the people, and the land would ultimately go to the peasants. That's the best thing they can yes. do. Uh, but that means already completing the new democratic revolution. While that is not possible, uh, what is called minimum land reform program is carried out. Yeah? The landlords can still negotiate. No? You can still distinguish the enlightened ones from the despotic ones. Um, uh, the enlightened ones have also agreed to reduce the uh, land rent, uh, the interest mm -hmm. rates, and improve the uh, wages, and so on and so forth. So um, there are the bigger things. There are things that the uh, revolutionary forces can do. Uh, at the grassroots level in many, in very simple, concrete ways. Then you have the strategic uh, um, direction of political work and that will uh, advance the agrarian revolution and uh, uh, will lead to the free distribution of land after the confiscation of land uh, from those landlords, you know, usually landlords. Yes. Should, uh, simply inherit their their land holdings, or they have be, been corrupt officials, and they buy land. No, um, yeah. Uh, uh, you cannot be sad about their losing the land in favor of the peasants that they exploit. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. So, anyway, thank you for indulging me on my little tangent. Um, so this is the last question. <laughs> Uh, could you please share a bit more how um, us, the people waging the revolution in the countryside, um, ensure food security? I suppose you already touched on it a little bit, but <laughs> please elaborate a bit more. Uh, what was the question again? Uh, it's not posted oh, sorry. yet. Sorry. Um, could you share a bit of how... Um, the people waging the revolution in the countryside could ensure food security. Well, I think um, um, uh, the main point is to rely on the peasant masses um, mm -hmm. in order to raise the level of production and so on and so forth. So I've already demonstrated how uh, big changes can occur when the revolutionary forces come in uh, to the villages. So I, I referred to what the revolutionary forces can do. No? Uh, yes. Like, uh, helping in production and calling on the expert of the experts of the revolutionary movement to uh, g give the proper guidelines for uh, making production more effective and then the most the most important thing is the political work eh? to accomplish yeah. the um, minimum land reform program that's very possible and it's also possible and during the period of the minimum land reform program if the land is grabbed eh, from the peasants or from the you know those the homesteaders um, yeah. you can easily tear up the you know 
uh, in the papers of Dylan Graber and say, oh, that those papers belong to you, but the land belong belong to the people, so go away. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you want to stay, then you will have to spend so much on on um, guarding your la uh, the, the land, and uh, uh, so you know. And the the, uh, the land grabber usually computes <laughs> that he cannot really sustain uh, what he has, uh, you know, possession of what he has grabbed. And um, um, it, it is even possible to concentrate on despotic landlords. Once in okay. Central Luzon, uh, there was a despotic landlord who was too harsh. Uh, so, yeah. one, so what we did to, was to advise, you know, a landlord cannot control the land, no? By himself, mm -hmm. he has to use overseers. So, uh, whenever he had an overseer, we would advise the overseer to look for another job. We did not have to harm him, but we advise him kindly uh, to yeah. look another job. And then when the landlord assigns another overseer, we do the same thing. And the landlord ends up without any overseer. In, in fact, the landlord, the land can no longer be. Eh? Uh, yeah. The, the land and the peasants can no longer be exploited by the despotic landlord. So um, uh, I'm, I'm explaining to you tactics in the revolutionary <laughs> Uh, and then when when the NPA uh, uh, platoons and companies become uh, um, become uh, companies and battalions, large areas will uh, uh, allow uh, confiscation of land from the landlords. And you know, in the period of strategic stalemate, that becomes possible. Even right now, uh, in this period of uh, strategic defensive, you know. Uh, if there is no big brother around from the army, eh, and the local reactionaries have only the local police force of around a platoon size. So if the NPA has a platoon size in the municipality, uh, or within, uh, or even uh, within a number of towns, uh, the local landlord power is still mated. Uh, especially mm -hmm. they don't know uh, where the NPA is and the NPA moves. Um, mm -hmm. um, it is the end uh, when they even even when they when they call the army to help the police, uh, they are blind uh, as to where the NPA is, you know, because the people keep blind those uh, those who uh, exploit and oppress them. Uh, you get the yeah. point. Even before you reach the strategic stalemate, localized uh, tactical stalemates already uh, develop in order to prepare the future of the strategic stalemate. Mm -mm. Yes, thank you so much for that, Tito Joe. That was so insightful. And yeah, no, thank you. Thank you again for answering all of these questions. I really appreciate it. Um, before we end this program, I would just like to once again shout out and explain a bit more regarding the one Sambayan launching in France today. As this election for the 2022 national election in the Philippines is coming, let us move to tirelessly and unite up to build an opposition that will topple down the rottening, the dead the regime, and advance the people's interest in the parliament. We congratulate this one Bayan, Tambayan France for launching their chapter today. If you have missed this, please do watch it from the Facebook page which they posted earlier. One Sambayan Paris, France. With speeches from the one Sambayan conveyors, attorney Javi Calleja and Father Albert Baringbert Alejo, alongside attorney Neri Colmenares and Suana Concepcion. Her Excellency, VP Lenny Lobredo, will give her a message of solidarity as well. Once again, salute to all the united opposition and long live the Filipino people. Again, Thank you so much today, Tito Joe. Uh, thank you, Ren. Maraming salamat. Uh, uh, this is quite an opportunity uh, to uh, get up, uh, ourselves enlightened through interaction and by uh, uh, not only with you, but also with our listeners. We got the questions that uh, um, uh, required further explanations. I hope that uh, uh, we can keep this up 
and uh, uh, try to ra raise the level of uh, our consciousness so that we become more militant and more effective in fighting uh, the class enemy, especially the imperialist and uh, ex local exploiting classes in the Philippines. Yes, definitely agree with that, Dr. Joe. Well, I'm Islamat. Well, thank you, everyone who's listening and watching today, and thank you for all the questions that you've submitted. Tune in again next week for ND Online for more educational <laughs> tactics. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> bye, 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 everyone. Bye. <laughs>